In this video, we're going to be looking at different patient populations that might have difficulty with breathing. Now, obviously, breathing is a cycle and it has two components. And so when we say difficulty with breathing, it could be issues with inspiration or inhalation. And it could be issues with expiration or exhalation, or it could be a combination of both. The first patient population we're going to look at is those with obstructive pulmonary diseases. Here are three of the most common obstructive conditions. The first one here is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, usually abbreviated COPD. And then there's the related condition, emphysema. And both of these conditions tend to be caused by excessive smoking throughout life. You can see over here the right lung is a healthy lung. The person likely has never smoked. And over here, the left lung, this is a diseased lung. This is a COPD lung caused by excessive smoking. That smoking causes damage to the lung all the way down to the cellular level, to the alveoli. And it really makes it difficult for these people to exhale. So generally speaking, obstructive diseases, there's more of an issue with exhalation or expiration than there is inhalation. And with these two conditions, since there are actual structural changes, physical damage to the lungs, they're more or less irreversible. And the only thing we can do is really manage those conditions and prevent them from getting worse. The third obstructive pulmonary disease here is asthma. And we know that asthma can be treated, it can be managed, and it's generally treated with an inhaled bronchodilator and sometimes combined with a corticosteroid. The second patient population here with issues breathing are those with restrictive pulmonary diseases. Restrictive diseases generally result in difficulty with inhalation. As opposed to obstructive diseases, there's generally more of a problem with exhalation. So what are some restrictive pulmonary diseases? Well, the first one here is interstitial lung disease. And an example of that is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis where there's actually scar tissue deposited within the lungs, making it difficult to inhale. Another related condition is sarcoidosis. This one is an autoimmune condition. And there's some other ones we may not usually think about as restrictive pulmonary diseases, like scoliosis. Over here, you can actually see a radiograph of the spine of someone with scoliosis. And of course, here is the thoracic spine. We can see all the ribs, right? Here's the outline of the heart. So you know this is actually the left side over here. This is the right side over here. Now, the left lung right here might be okay, but if you look at the scoliotic curvature, it's impinging into this right pleural space. And so that's going to create less space for this right lung. And if there's less space for it, so essentially compression on it, you're going to have difficulty inhaling on this side. Now, of course, the scoliotic curvature can manifest in a number of ways. In some cases, it could affect the right lung. Other cases, it might affect the left lung, and in some cases, it could affect both of them. So when the scoliotic curvature is severe enough, oftentimes surgery is warranted, just so you don't have issues with the lungs and or the heart. Then we have thoracic hyperkyphosis, another spinal issue where there's excessive kyphosis in the thoracic spine. So to understand this, I want you to stand up, get a nice upright posture, perfect posture, and then just take a deep breath in. Not very hard, right? Well then, still standing, I want you to slouch down at the thoracic spine. Essentially, try to push your rib cage almost into your pelvis. So really, really bad posture. Now, take a deep breath in. Much more challenging, right? Because now, your rib cage doesn't have a lot of room to expand. And if you have some belly fat, well now your belly fat is in between your pelvis and your ribs, making it even more difficult. So, thoracic hyperkyphosis, which is essentially that slouched position, right? You have excessive kyphosis there. That's going to cause difficulty with inhalation. And the same thing goes for obesity. How does obesity cause this? Well, imagine somebody in the supine position, lying on their back. They've got a lot of central adiposity. And when you inhale, what does the rib cage have to do? It has to expand. And if you're in the supine position, essentially, the rib cage moves up. It moves toward the ceiling. Well... If you've got a lot of body fat covering that, it's going to make it more difficult for the ribs to move up, right? Because the fat is essentially weighing the ribs down. So in any case, obesity makes inhalation more difficult, and it would be classified as a restricted pulmonary disease if it was contributing to difficulty breathing. 
The third patient population is those with progressive neurological conditions where there is damage to the nervous system. Now, how could this cause difficulty breathing? Well, remember, the diaphragm is innervated by the phrenic nerve. In fact, each half of the diaphragm, which is termed a hemidiaphragm, is innervated by the ipsilateral phrenic nerve. So the left hemidiaphragm receives motor innervation from the left phrenic nerve and vice versa. And if you have any of these conditions and more, which are not included here, these can cause eventual damage to the phrenic nerve, making it more difficult to breathe. And examples of conditions would be Parkinson's disease, Guillain-Barre syndrome, ALS, and multiple sclerosis. And here's one of the most famous individuals with ALS, that was the late Stephen Hawking, who actually lived a very long time with it because he had a specific variant that essentially fatigued and it just left him in this handicapped state for many, many years. But ALS can cause difficulty breathing and eventual respiratory failure, which is one of the causes of death in ALS and other conditions like Guillain-Barre syndrome especially. Now, what if you have a patient that has difficulty breathing but there's absolutely nothing wrong with their cardiopulmonary system. Everything's healthy and intact. No obstructive disease, no restrictive disease, no neurological condition, lungs are healthy, heart is healthy, but they've still got dyspnea, difficulty breathing. Well, it could be one of these three things down here. The first one is significant hypomobility of the costotransverse joint. Now, the ribs, generally speaking, articulate with their corresponding thoracic vertebra, at two places. This one shown in green right here is actually the costovertebral joint. Uh, that's not the one we're going to be assessing directly. It's actually this joint right here between uh, the rib and the transverse process of the corresponding thoracic vertebra. This is the costotransverse joint. And we can assess the mobility of that joint via several special tests. The first special test is the first rib mobility assessment. And as its name suggests, it's only going to be looking at mobility of the first rib, and we cover that in a separate video. The second one over here, which is pictured on the right, this is the prone costotransverse rib springing or rib spring test. And this one is extremely useful for looking at mobility of ribs two all the way down, although generally it's really for ribs two down through ten. And again, we cover that in a separate video. Now, if you find that any of these ribs are hypomobile, well, the obvious treatment is to mobilize them. And so, obviously, we can do a first rib mobilization or manipulation. Then we can do prone costotransverse mobilizations or manipulations. And that should take that hypomobility and turn it into, well, normal mobility. You can also have tightness of the inspiratory muscles. So you can actually have tightness of the diaphragm. You can have tightness of the intercostal muscles. These are actually the external intercostal muscles. And so if there's muscle tightness, well, the obvious treatment is to stretch those muscles. And in a separate video, we're going to go over how you actually do those stretches. And then finally, inspiratory muscle weakness. And this is mainly going to be weakness of the thoracic diaphragm. A lot of times individuals who have weakness in the diaphragm will be visibly using their accessory muscles, scalene, sternocleidomastoid, etc., when they're inhaling. And if you see that, well then you definitely need to have them strengthen their diaphragm. And again, we're gonna go over that in another video as well. Particularly how to use an inspiratory muscle training device. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of all the major patient populations that can have difficulty with breathing. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.